On uh, March 3rd, 1934, John Dillinger escaped from the Crown Point Jail. And at that time, he had locked up 32 individuals and escaped in Lily and Holly's car, which is actually right behind us right there. The story starts out that uh, John Dillinger's father uh, passed away in uh, 1943. And uh, when, before Dillinger's father passed away, he had given the wooden gun to, uh, to Audrey his uh, oldest uh, daughter, which is Dillinger's sister. And uh, she kept the gun for quite a while. And then uh, later on in years, the family would ask her, uh, you know, where the gun was. And she said that she had misplaced it, but she did not misplace it. Her oldest son, Fred, uh, took the gun away, took the gun. And uh, he finally found an individual in Chicago to, that was willing to purchase it. So those people actually, uh, the oldest father passed away. And after he passed away, uh, his son, he, his son knew about, you know, knew that his father had the gun, but he didn't really do anything until later on after his mother passed away. Then, you know, he sought me, he sought me out to see if I could you know, figure out if it was the real gun or if it wasn't the real gun. The real story about what really happened with the wooden gun is that uh, Ar Arthur O'Leary uh, was the person that concocted the whole story together to, to bring in a wooden gun to the Crown Point Jail. Because Dillinger had been trying to uh, get somebody to bring him a real gun in the jail. But uh, Blunk, they found out that uh, Blunk he was the turnkey of the jail that, you know, he was willing to help them, but he wasn't willing to bring in a real gun. But he didn't have, he didn't seem to have a problem with a wooden gun. So Larry went to a wood craftsman off of uh, Kedzie in Chicago at that time and, uh, and had a wood craftsman fabricate a gun for the jailbreak. And after he did that, then uh, it was smuggled in by uh, Louis Perquette, his attorney. They cut the inside of a Bible to fit the gun and put the gun inside a Bible to give it to Dillinger. And during that time, after Dillinger got the gun, they had, a, they had to keep with the story that he carved a gun in jail. So Blunk uh, cut up a a regular washboard and threw underneath the bunk of the, of the jail to, to cover up the, the actually, you know, make it look like that he actually carved it there, but he didn't carve the gun in jail at all. He would have never been able to, uh, you know, drill the holes and everything else it would have took to drill it, to do the gun. He would have had to have a drill press and they didn't have a drill press in Crown Point Jail. Uh, this photograph right here was taken at the Dillinger farm in April 6th, 1934. This was taken by his family members. Uh, original copy of this photo hangs in the Dillinger family's home. And this is, this is a blown up version of the original photo. As you can plainly see, uh, he's holding a Tommy gun here, but you can plainly see the gun here, the way the, shape, the gun is shaped. It's flat on the sides, it's flat on the bottom, it's round on top, and it has a large uh, gash in the side of it and you can plainly see that in the photo right here. This article right here was done November 11th 1934. This, this is the first article that John Dillinger's father did. He even signed an affidavit with the newspaper company that, that everything he was about to tell them is true and he actually showed the, the real wooden gun right here. Now the reason that his father would always keep this wooden gun is because when Dillinger was at the farm house, he told his father, don't ever get rid of this gun because whenever you're sad, you can, you can take it out and you'll laugh about what I did. So his father did promise that he would never get rid of it and he did keep his word. But as you can, as I will show that this, you can plainly see is the same gun right here. I'm just glad to finally, you know, lay to rest, uh, you know, the, the wooden gun because it's, you know, it, it started even right after Dillinger escaped from the jail. Uh, Ernest Blunk 
decided that he was going to uh, make a version of the wooden gun and he knew people would believe it because he's the one that took the famous ride with Dillinger when he escaped from Crown Point Jail. So his story at the time is that he was riding with Dillinger and Dillinger gave him the wooden gun. And right after, when he got back to Crown Point, you know, he started working on, you know, this gun because he knew, you know, it would, it would bring quite a bit of money at the time. Even back then, uh, it's been told that Blunk received $1,000 for that gun. And had this photo been made right here before he sold it, then they would have plainly seen that that gun wasn't the real gun. These right here are rare photos that is of the gun that they believe to be the one that Dillinger used at the Crown Point Jail to escape on March 3rd, 1934. This, how this gun came about is right after Dillinger was killed at the Biograph Theater, um, Louis Briquette and Arthur O'Leary went to John Dillinger's father's farm and asked him if he would be willing to part with the gun uh, that Dillinger gave him. And he told him that he could never part with the gun because of the promise that he made his son. They even offered to purchase it from him and he still wouldn't let it go. So at that time, they weren't happy with what they heard. So O'Leary decided that he was going to go back to the woodmaker and have another gun made like that one and that they were going to pedal it off uh, that way. So, but what had happened in between uh, O'Leary getting the, this gun right here is that uh, Briquette and O'Leary um, were going to be indicted for harboring a fugitive, which would be John Dillinger. So Briquette was very worried about going to prison himself and O'Leary. So they decided that they were going to take the gun, this gun right here, they were going to get rid of it. But O'Leary didn't get rid of the gun. He planted it inside the wall of his house. And right after, not too long after that, he passed away. And then that was the end of that for quite a bit of time. But later on, you know, let's move forward years. Uh, this was in the late 90s. A uh, gentleman was restoring the house and he found this wooden gun. So he had taken this wooden gun. He heard about the, the Crown Point, the, not Crown Point, but he heard about the Indiana um, Museum about Dillinger. So he brought this to Joe Pinkston and Joe Pinkston absolutely wasn't 100% convinced that it was the real gun, but it had been the closest one that he had ever seen. So he purchased uh, the wooden gun from them for $5,000. I'm about to show you the real wooden gun and why we believe it is the real wooden gun. As you can see, the, the photograph of, the, of Dillinger standing at the farm on April 6, 1934. This photo was taken by his family at the family farm. Later on, after Dillinger passed away, his father done an interview with this newspaper. And here you can see that Dillinger, uh, his father, he uh, wrote an affidavit up and it was notarized and everything that everything he was about to say was true. And they took pictures of the real wooden gun that had been given to John Dillinger's father. And as you can see, that this gun is, di is the, exactly the same as the one that's in this picture. It's different than this one. Because as you can see, this gun is flat on both sides and on the bottom and is round. This gun right here is completely round all the way around with no flat sides. You can, all, you can also see the, the notch in the side of the gun right here, and you can plainly see it in that photo too. And um, another very important thing that people, people you know, can understand is like your fingerprints. Um, your hands have a fingerprints that nobody else has. 
wood has a fingerprint of its own. You, you can't change the, you know, how a piece of wood is made. Uh, so as I will show you that it matches this identically. I'll also talk about other guns that were in history that's been out there. Um, the most recent one is the gun that was uh, sold by uh, John Dillinger's half-sister, uh, Francis. Now, that was sold with some of John Dillinger's uh, earliest uh, things with his clothes and there was a gun sold that was his and different artifacts. Now, even though that gun uh, was not the one that Dillinger used to escape from Crown Point, it was a very important part of history because it was the gun that John Dillinger's father used to do seminars. John Dillinger's father and uh, Dillinger's sister and different people of his family went around doing um, crime doesn't pay seminars for a, quite a while with Billy Furchette. Now that gun that was sold at the auction is, is that gun that John Dillinger's father made uh, to use in the uh, crime doesn't pay seminars because he did not want to carry this gun with him. If this gun somehow got lost, it would, be, it, it would have been a terrible thing. The next gun I'm going to talk about is the gun that was made by Melvin Purvis's uh, family, that uh, it was Melvin Purvis III identified the gun as being the one that Dillinger uh, used to break out of Crown Point Jail. But um, as you can uh, l look it up if you uh, want to, uh, that gun does not even resemble uh, this gun at all. So that's an easy one to point out that it's not the real gun. I like sharing it with the world. Uh, I, you know, again, I think it's very important, you know, for for people to understand history and children. Uh, you know, more needs to be taught about history, and you know, I think this is something that you know people enjoy. So you know, I like showing it to the world. There will not be any doubt in anybody's mind anywhere in the country, uh, which is which. So. I, I'm very confident in that.